uh, over a year and a half ago, I started to want to understand a lot better how um, in, autonomous agents can learn uh, and what are the constraints on them in learning. And I thought one way to do this was to look at uh, existing architectures. And although it might seem that for someone like me, it would be relatively straightforward to compare Soren Actar, it turned out to be a long, long process. Um, and part of it was to decide what are the right dimensions for comparison, but also then to dig up uh, the details of both SOAR and ACTAR. I should know SOAR, but there's some details that I needed some help with. But I want to thank a lot of people who gave pre comments on previous drafts of um, the paper that you saw. I also say that there's a more formal uh, description of these architectures that I developed. And that is, uh, there's a link in the paper to that if you want to go to the website. And so you can see a formalization. So uh, this talk is about comparing cognitive architectures. I chose ACTAR, which is best known for its ability to model human behavior, although it has been used in developing agents, and SOAR, which has been used for developing complex cognitive agents and some modeling. So it's good that their first and second goals sort of overlap in, in interesting ways. And these are you know, two of the most mature and general common model architectures based on, the, um, well, the common model is based on them. They're freely available. They've been applied to hundreds of tasks. They both support real-time performance. So they show that it is possible to have complex agents that achieve real-time performance and they have online incremental learning that happens while they're doing performance. So they are not using any offline learning mechanisms. So to me, those are important characteristics and to understand how cognitive architectures can achieve them is important. There's many other cognitive architectures that I didn't look at, and those are on my to-do list, but these um, have the quality that they're pretty similar to each other, but they're also different. This also leads me to a deeper analysis than what was possible when we did the work on the common model. So let me talk a little bit about the common model. Uh, this was a community consensus, um, which is an, and it's an abstract specification of a human-like cognitive architecture. Uh, we see it um, together with Christian and Paul Rosenblum that it's a baseline for development and uh, cumulative progress. So other people can build on it, start their architectures, maybe similar to the cognitive to the common model, but also distinguish it by saying, I differ from the common model in this way. And we think that will help uh, guide research and also on individual components. The other thing that is somewhat surprising to me is how much this has actually then led to testable theories for the cognitive structures and functions. So if you look at some papers recently by Andrea Stoko and his students, they've been able to take the common model, even though it's just this kind of connectivity diagram and compare it to data that's extracted from say fMRI and the dynamics of that and show that the common model is a very good explanation for those, for what we know about humans. And I wanna say multiple times, this is not a prescription for all cognitive architectures. There are many different niches for cognitive architectures and many different design and research goals that people have. And so this is not necessarily appropriate for those. So this is what we have sort of found a commonality on. Key idea is that it's a fixed structure of communicating modules. We have procedural long-term memory, working memory, declarative memory, perception, and motor, and that there are architectural learning mechanisms associated with these um, different components. Uh, there's the reference for the paper if you're more interested in it. This is the original diagram we used. I'm gonna use a slightly different diagram just speak for the purposes of this talk. And so we once again have procedural memory, declarative memory, working memory, perception, and motor. You're gonna get um, bored with this, this, this diagram, but it's gonna show up throughout my talk. So uh, what are some of the key ideas in the common model? That the modules are all task independent. Uh, they have nothing to do with any specific task. And so there's no natural language model. There's no planning module, no navigation model. If you wanna do those kinds of activities, the common model philosophy or hypothesis is that's possible to do, be done through encoding long-term knowledge or learning long-term knowledge and procedural memory and declarative memory, as well as what happens in perception and motor. 
So that those are, so although that is one approach is to do modules such as this, that's not what goes on in the common model. Um, there's also no task specific learning modules. All the learning modules are very general and we'll go through those today. There's also no executive control, metacognition or attentional module, modules. Um, we'll talk a little bit about at the end, um, how that's, how we see those types of activities performed in the common model, but the spoiler alert is that we see that as just more processing between procedural memory, working memory, declarative memory, perception, and motor. That there is not um, special processing modules for that. There might be special data made available for processing, but there is not distinct types of processing for that. All right, so this is an over outline of the talk. I'm gonna give an overview of architecture. Um, and this is sort of taking uh, the commonalities between SOAR and ACT-R. Then we will go through working memory, procedural memory, and declarative memory, and look at commonalities and distinctions or differences between them. And then finally, at the end, I'll say, what did I learn after all this process? Because I did learn some things. Maybe they're obvious. Maybe they won't be things you learned, but they're things I learned. So let's start, off, start with architectural processing. There's a basic cycle in both of these systems that goes from uh, execution of knowledge in procedural memory, which is usually rule-like structures, and that performs an internal action on working memory. That internal action can either be to do internal reasoning, to initiate a declarative memory retrieval, it could be to initiate a motor action, or it can modulate perception in some way. So procedural memory is what drives the basic cycle of the system in, cog in act R when we're modeling human behavior that occurs at 50 milliseconds and the same thing in SOAR. So we see 50 milliseconds is the basic cycle. Retrievals from declarative memory um, don't necessarily can be asynchronous. So you can initiate one and that can take longer than 50 milliseconds. And then there could be more procedural memory activity going on as well as asynchronous perception and motor activity. So that's the basic architectural processing and that is consistent with the common model. So I then make a distinction about what is agent data. And by agent data, I mean data that encodes agent and task knowledge. So in th that case, it's what are the contents of procedural memory, declarative memory and working memory. And each of those consists of elements, memory elements that are basically symbolic. They might have numeric or other kinds of representations embedded them, but essentially they're symbolic structures and that they can each one be, uh, each element can be created independently, modified independently or deleted. So in procedural memory, we'll see these are rule-like structures, declarative memory, um, they're the, um, graphic type structures as, uh, um, and parts of graphs and the same thing in working memory. So the key th idea is that th this, these are the data that are used to reason about uh, the agent's tasks and perform agent actions. And the architecture itself really doesn't understand the contents of this knowledge. It only understands the form and can process it, such as matching working memory to procedural memory or using cues from working memory to do retrievals from declarative memory. The, it's not like the architecture looks in and ever sees what the content is. And so that these can be arbitrarily symbols, symbol structures for the most part. So in addition to agent data, there we can distinguish types of agent data. So the basic type is just internal agent data, which is working memory, procedural memory, and declarative memory. And that, as I said, is unconstrained concept, content. But one of the things that I discovered, um, I mean, it's just sitting you in the face when you look at it, is another kind of very special agent data is the commands that are sent through working memory, through the buffers, these are buffers, to the different modules. So the, each of these modules has a buffer, doesn't, procedural memory doesn't have one, but you can send commands to do a retrieval, or you can send a command to do a, a motor action. And that has to be architecturally defined because these modules like this have to be able to interpret those commands, such as to move something or to do a retrieval. So that does provide a set of innate or fixed set of symbols that define these module commands. So that is where there is constraint on, const, on commands, I mean, on the content. 
There's also one more thing, which is the modules themselves, while they're performing their actions or where they're processing, they can send back status information. So the module for motor can send back a status that says, I'm busy, or I've completed the action, or declared a memory can send back a status that says, I finished, or I failed to do any retrieval. So that once again, imposes a set of fixed symbols that are architecturally defined for all the agents. And so I just think that's interesting that we have unconstrained content for the most part flowing around data through these three, but we also have constrained ones that are the way the modules interact with each other, all right? Maybe there could be other architectures where this is less constrained, but that's true for these architectures. All right, so there's also something called metadata. And this is a little bit of controversy. Um, so what I define metadata is, is data about agent data elements. So that is associated with each agent data element. There can be additional data about it. It is not defined as data used in meta reasoning. So that's sometimes people say, well, my system's got this meta reasoning component. Well, all the data in that meta reasoning component is metadata. Well, we're gonna constrict the definition here to be just data about data. It turns out that originally in the common model, we thought all of this was quantitative or numeric data, but in examining SOAR and ACT-R, it turns out there's also relational metadata. And this also has fixed semantics because it is the architecture that maintains and updates the metadata. It is not possible for agent data to directly change it. It's only indirectly happening. So let's go through some examples. So there are, is activation of long-term memory elements um, and declarative memory, that's activation. There's also utility associated with procedural memory elements. And there's something called derivational data for working memory agents, for working memory elements that has to do with how a working memory element was created. Um, as I said, Metadata is created, updated, and tested by the architecture. So it lives in this other world from agent data. Agent data is testing agent data, modifying it, storing it, or whatever. But then there's metadata, which is about that, and it's the architecture watching that processing of the agent data and updating the metadata as it goes. And it is not accessible or modifiable by agent data in SOAR and ACT-R. So what is metadata used for? Well, it influences retrieval from production memory, from procedural memory and declarative memory. So activation influences and biases the retrieval. Utility biases which procedural memory element is used in order to change working memory. It also is used in learning. And um, so, and it's also used in forgetting. So, uh, that is what controls those aspects. So in one sense, it's an intentional mechanism because it focuses the processing based on uh, the, the values in the metadata. All right, so we've gone through a big overview. Now let's dive in to how this actually works in SOAR and ACT-R. So we're gonna go through working memory, procedural memory, and declarative memory. And I will admit, this is a slog. And so um, we'll try to come back at the end and summarize the, the commonalities and differences, but um, we are gonna go through a level of detail that might, uh, might be a little bit tough to, go, to handle. So let's go through working memory. So working memory is relational graph structures in both SOAR and ACT-R, where an element, an individual element is a node, a um, uh, attribute here, um, or a labeled edge, and then a value. And then these are collected together in terms of what we call a declarative chunk. Now that is act R terminology. We don't call them chunks in SOAR. In SOAR, we call a chunk something else. But hey, they've been calling these chunks longer than we've been calling our chunks chunks. So we'll go with that this is a chunk. It's a collection of elements. And it, the chunks themselves have something called a chunk name. And they can be uh, manipulated either on individual elements or as a chunk as a whole. And one of the things that can be the value of one of these is another chunk name, which then give, leads this out to be a graphical structure. Another important aspect of working memory is that there's these buffers I talked about. 
The buffers allow communication to the modules. So in a buffer, you could have a chunk that is then knowledge that is either transferred to a, of the other module, such as if we want to do a retrieval, we'll send a chunk, which is a partial specification of what we want to retrieve. And then declare in memory, we'll send back a chunk, which is what we get back. It will also have module commands, which are read only. So um, um, a command goes in here. I'm sorry. They're, um, they're really not read only. I, I made a mistake there. Um, but there is a fixed semantics to them. That's predefined. And then there's module status where the declarative memory, for example, will say, I've completed my retrieval and here it is, or I failed. And so the module status data is really meta process data. It's data about the processing in a module. So it's data about say for the motor system, I am now busy working on this motor command or I've just finished this motor command. So this is what gives the agent data a peek into what's happening in its modules in terms of processing, not the results of processing, but what the processing is. All right. So that's something I learned is that these are distinguished aspects that are worth thinking about separately from other agent data. So what are some of the differences between working memory and uh, in SOAR and ACTR? Well, in ACTR, there's a fixed number of buffers. There's a buffer for each module. There might be additional modules in ACTR than I've shown here. So there might be a, what they call a goal module and a goal buffer. There could be a, a marginal buffer and a marginal buffer. Also, for some implementations of things like natural language understanding, it turns out that just having one, just having the buffer and nothing else gets a to make it difficult. So sometimes there's additional buffers that are sort of task dependent. That sort of is sort of on the line between act our theory or not, but that's what we see in practice. And these are single levers, levels, so there's no substructure. SOAR, on the other hand, has an unlimited graph in working memory. Um, these are connected together usually, and the, it can have unlimited breadth and depth and they're rooted in what are called state nodes. Um, also, there's additional states that are created on impasses in procedural memory usage, and that provides meta process data on what's going on in procedural memory. These are the standard impasses in SOAR, and this allows for what we call recursive universal subgoaling. So that is, that, those are some of the differences. All right, so, there's also working memory metadata that's maintained. And this is, um, I don't, I think this is sort of new uh, concept is that it turns out that in order to do some of the maintenance between uh, declarative memory and working memory, long-term declarative memory, whenever something is retrieved into the declarative memory buffer in working memory, there's a metadata is created that connects what's retrieved to where it is back in declarative memory. This is for you. This is used for updating um, additional metadata, which has to do with the um, activation um, or usage in declarative memory. So it is something that's really there. It's a symbolic relational thing. The other thing is when uh, there's retrievals from procedural memory, we get an instantiation of that procedural memory element and that is associated with the working memory elements that are created by it. And that is used in procedural learning. So in working memory maintains this data and SOAR, this is the data that's used then to doing backtraces for chunking. And for ACT-R, it's a, maybe it's a slightly different than what I've described here, but it's what's used in order to do um, production composition. So in ACTAR, they have the same as above. SOAR also has a few other types of activation. We've implemented an activation for working memory. It's not really needed in ACTAR because they have these fixed set of buffers. And when new things come in, they just replace what's there. So there's never a case of working memory growing, whereas in SOAR it can grow. And so we use base level activation, which is based on the recency and frequency of access. And we use forgetting to bias and we also use it to bias declarative memory retrievals. Um, there's also a relational um, type of working memory metadata uh, 
that is um, tells the system what substate something is in, and that's also used for maintaining the substates and for chunking. Let's move along. Um, so procedural memory, um, what would they have in common is that a single pr production, I mean, so procedural memory element is selected on the cognitive cycle. And this is rule-like and that is conditions and actions. In ACTAR, that's exactly what it is. It's a rule. In SOAR, really, um, if we wanna go with this idea of a single procedural memory element selected and applied, that really corresponds to what we call an operator in SOAR, which is actually implemented as a collection of rules. So in SOAR, there's a procedural memory element we'll say is a single rule, is a set of rules that fire in parallel to implement that operator. We also have the concept if that is, if it's failed to select an operator, we get an impasse, which leads to substate correction, collection, cr creation. So that's different between SOAR and ACT-R. Um, just to see this rule versus SOAR idea, here are the different aspects of an individual rule, conditions, we select the rule, the selected rule actions are um, used in order to change the contents of buffers. And SOAR, all of these different aspects of rules map onto the conditions um, that are used to determine what rule is selected. And we have multiple operator, I mean, multiple rules that can apply an operator in SOAR. So- John, John, I'm sorry, five minutes, please. Thank you. We have procedural memory metadata as well in common there's utility associated with procedural memory elements, and that's computed. Uh, then we that's computed via temporal difference learning and reward, and that's what ACTR has. SOAR also has that. We also have some activation associated with rules because we've experimented with forgetting rules that are rarely, if ever, um, fired. Um, procedural memory le learning in common, they both have RL, which is updated using utility metadata. And they also have procedural composition, which uses that derivational metadata I talked about. In SOAR and ACTAR, the difference, there's differences in details in each of these, but essentially it's the same functionality. So they have the same procedural memory ideas. In declarative memory, they have in common, both have declarative memory, which is actually a graph structure not shown here, but these are graph structures, same um, as working memory. So structures like this are in declarative memory. That's what ACTAR has. SOAR is a little different in that it does split declarative memory into two different kinds, a semantic memory, which is exactly declarative memory, but we also have an episodic memory, which is a rec record of changes to working memory. So we have two. Um, the metadata is in common, they both have base level activation associated with every chunk, and that's computed based on recency and frequency of access, and it influences future retrievals from declarative memory. ACTAR also has that, but they also have an association strength between elements that co-occur um, in buffers. And this is this was existed a long time ago. It went away. It's come back. So if you read some of the recent papers by John Anderson, you'll find reference to this. This association strength is used in spreading activation. SOAR has something similar. Um, they have base level activation, and they also have um, spreading activation between elements. And there's episodic memory, which also has temporal sequencing metadata in there. So in terms of retrieval differences, ACTAR is, also has spontaneous retrieval. SOAR also allows a direct retrieval where you can use the name of a chunk to do a direct retrieval on it. Um, in terms of learning, you add a chunk to declarative memory whenever a buffer is cleared and you update declarative um, chunks with activations when they're used. SOAR does not have a declarative learning mechanism. We wish we did. Um, it does have direct storage and it does update declarative memory activation when chunks are used, just like ACTAR. And all changes to working memory are recorded in episodic memory. So what did I learn? So there's a bunch of commonalities and I'm not gonna go through these because we've sort of done them. Uh, the big thing for me is the commonality and how metadata is used and how it interacts with the processes for retrieval and learning. Um, and I think that that has sort of been something we haven't emphasized as much as we could. And that uh, finally learning is a side effect. We also have all these differences. They're, yeah, they're major, they're important, but at a top level, they're so similar that these, dages, these differences are really variants on a theme. So it's not that, um, and you could imagine, uh, and you know, the fact that SOAR has unconstrained working memory is huge compared to working memory in ACTAR, 
But in the scheme of things, you know, the fact that the commonalities are much stronger. I think the biggest takeaway I have is that there's these three types of data that have different properties. There's the agent data, which has its own life and how it interacts with each other. It's tested and modified by procedural memory. Um, we also have agent metadata, which we've talked about, which does not mix with agent data. We also have module state status data, which is created by the modules um, and is open for uh, meta. It gives an opening for metacognition, and it can be tested by procedural memory, but it cannot be modified. So to me. Getting these distinctions was a really important part. I didn't really have them in my mind beforehand. So um, I talked about you know, no executive control. And so my view is that what's happening is we are relying on the processing metadata we get from these other modules. And that just becomes data that then is used by procedural memory to do these kinds of metacognition and attention and executive control. And so what's the future? Analyze more architectures ask how do we represent other kinds of metacognitive and meta memory appraisals. I go over this in the paper, things like familiarity of belief, feeling of knowing. We expect that maybe what's going on there is we can actually have readable metadata. Um, not true right now in the systems, but maybe we can get metadata that is like, how likely was it that I retrieved this? I would like to incorporate modality specific representations in this and also fold it back into the common model of cognition. Thank you very much. And I will take any questions. I, it's kind of challenging for me to bring up the, um, the um, other thing, anything else, but um, I guess I can try. Is there any questions in the Slack? Yeah, uh, I, um, I can. Uh, read out a question from Pat, Pat Langley. I, I can read it. Okay. Ah, you it. can read it. Okay. Yes. Fair enough. The, please. Last, the last I call, the, recall, the common model gives no special status to goals, but some versions of ACT, R, and SOAR have treated them as distinct types of structures. What happened to them in the common model? So ACT, R no longer has any special status of goals. They have a goal buffer, but it's a buffer that you can put things in and take out, but it's just other data that can go in there. So there's no additional processing. The only special processing of goals are the go goals in SOAR that are created in response to um, impasses. So, um, but in terms of task goals, there are no special status. So the common model does make the hypothesis that there's no general special treatment of goals other than what you see um, in the things I've described. All right, so then Dustin asks, do you think there are any failures that occur in cognition where changing data alone is insufficient? Perhaps changing a parameter or a processing mechanism. So um, I'm gonna assume that what you're saying is that in, to recover from something, you have to do something besides just changing data like in the buffers or in working memory. And yes. so we would say that um, there might be parameters to a, like the motor system where you would uh, adjust that, but we don't right now like have parameters for um, what's the threshold for an activation to be retrieved from long-term memory from declarative memory? So I guess that's an important point. There are not, um, besides the actual like commands you send to these modules, which could have parameters to them, there's no additional parameters where the system is um, doing a lot of tweaking. Um, but I, I, I should say that there's more commands than maybe I let on for things like declarative memory. So for example, in declarative memory retrieval, one of the things you can do is specify things that are inhibited for retrieval. So that is part of designing the system is that interface between the modules and that's where those parameters would be. So that, um, so that would be um, how I would respond to that. Um, Dustin, you wanna follow up on that at all? Uh, no, that's very interesting, thank you. <laughs>
Yeah, we have just one minute remaining, please. Okay. Hector asks, is there a particular kind of problem or setting where one architecture would be more desirable than other to be used? Well, that gets to be uh, pretty uh, tough to say. I claim that for systems that require complex cognition, such as planning and more extensive metacognition, SOAR has, um, uh, you know, it has unlimited working memory, which makes it easier to represent a lot of structures that are more challenging to do in ACTAR. However, if you want to create models that will naturally force you to create systems that behave like humans, I would say ACTAR is the way to go. So if you're trying to model some human behavior, ACTAR is going to lead you in the direction of models that are going to be closer to human behavior than what you might get in SOAR. In SOAR, we end up creating models, but we often don't exploit all the capabilities of SOAR in modeling the human behavior. Thank you for the questions, and I'm go going to be done. I will Excellent. look at the uh, trailing comments if you have more questions.